I'll probably um, fire some bullets at you, and I'll do it in the form of uh, bullets. The first thing I have to say, although, as you can imagine, one feels uh, uncomfortable when, when, when you have to repeat yourself. But for the past almost 20 years, I've been saying repeatedly that the Palestinians, unfortunately, are retreating, are withdrawing, are backing down from the concept of the two-state solution. Every time I was speaking about Palestinians on this, on this podium, elsewhere, this is what I've been saying. I'm sorry to say I was absolutely right. This is what is happening, and it's happening in an accelerated uh, pace. The Palestinians keep saying to us, and I repeat what I used to say all these years, they are saying to us, runaway statehood, that it is a state for which you don't pay the full price in peace, you go to the General Assembly to get recognition as a state, or you get a unilateral withdrawal like they got in Gaza, or we, the Palestinians, are running away from statehood. What will you do? That's the strategy. It's being implemented uh, now. In fact, what we have is the uh, translation into diplomacy and <coughs> facts on the ground of what my friend uh, Dr. Ahmed Khaledi from St. Anthony's used to call the Palestinian state as a punitive construct, which is how most Palestinians view the prospect of statehood within 1967 uh, borders. Uh, so the PA, the PA is a sort of administrative disengagement between Israel and the Palestinian territories. Not, not much more than that. Whereas in the Gaza Strip, Strip, of course, we have by now, or since 2005, uh, uh, we have a full uh, withdrawal. The PA was perceived as the vehicle for state building. It's part and parcel of the concept of the two-state solution. But if the concept of the two-state solution is retreating, and I'm saying, as I say, it is. You have to be blind not to see that. The, the, the Palestinians don't have the craving, the oomph. This is not the objective of the Palestinian national movement. And I'll come to that. But if the, uh, there is a retreat, indeed, from the two-state solution, then there is a question mark hanging over the future of the PA and the viability uh, of the PA. What adds to that is the fact that the negative image of the PA is sustaining the popular drift away from the two-state solution. If this PA is what we Palestinians are going to get as our newly established state administration, thank you. That's the popular attitude towards the PA in the West Bank. So in many places, like Hebron, for example, the elders of the city, the big lands of Hebron, said to the governor there, thank you for being with us. Please don't interfere. In Jenin, they shot at the house of the governor. God bless his soul, Kadura Musa, was a fine man. And to this day, they don't dare arrest the people who uh, did it. In East Jerusalem, people, the big families, etc., are, telling, are to telling the governor of East Jerusalem, appointed by the PA, Please don't mess up with us. Let us keep the Israeli blue cards that we have. And allow us, of course, free movement uh, all over uh, Israel. 
it reaches a point where many of the functionaries uh, in the PA are either quietly seeking Israeli citizenship through all sorts of wastas. And I'm, I'm giving the example of what happened to many, to quite a few of the members of the negotiation support unit, which was the diplomatic team of Arafat and then of Abbas. I used to call them the negotiation sabotage team for their contribution to the uh, negotiations. Quite a few of them decided to become Israelis. The advisors are negotiations. And they are back in Israel. And they want to integrate in Israel, and they are studying Hebrew again. It's those who could become Israeli citizens. It's a telling example of what they think of the project. I believe, and my main, my main, my main argument is, that the PA is in a real danger of collapse and implosion, and first of all, because of bankruptcy. Just like many of you, I'm reading the World Bank reports. And all the economics of the situation, although I'm not an economist myself. But I'll give you my information. As a working journalist who talks to the people who run the treasury of the PA, I am saying that the, the debt is over $1.5 billion. I'm saying no banks, <coughs> no private bank will extend any more loans to the PA. That's finished. Bibi has to advance payments uh, against future revenues from collection of uh, 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 customs. We are in a situation where they are unable to pay full salaries on time and will not be able uh, to pay, where contractors, private contractors, rendering services to the PA are refusing to work with the PA because they don't get paid, or at least they don't get paid on, on time. We had, on different occasions, a situation where medications med were not supplied to local uh, hospitals run by the PA because of uh, arrears in, in, uh, in uh, uh, payments. Arab money is not coming. Qatar is giving $200 million to Gaza, but not to the West Bank. The UAE, for a different reason, is not paying. Saudis, one thing is pledges, one thing is payment. Every Arab state in the region has learned uh, this uh, lesson. So at present, the World Bank is saying, not me, and the World Bank was very optimistic about the Fayyad plan and Fayyadism. And he's a serious man who deserves much respect. But at this point, instead of reducing, reducing dependence of the PA and donors uh, 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 contributions, it's on the rise so that it's now 50% of GDP of the West Bank is donors' money. That's huge. And the World Bank, not me, is saying in its latest report that further growth is unsustainable. Unsustainable unless you can bring the uh, private sector. You want to bring the private sector into action? I invite you all to Jericho to the agro-industrial complex that the Japanese government has graciously uh, uh, established there. And uh, you're invited to look and find the Palestinian investors there. If you find them, let me know. Uh, 
my conclusion is that the PA is still in dire straits. The PA is indispensable in order to preserve, and I think we should, to preserve the prospect of a two-state solution. But probably it can't be saved if it's not expanded territorially in a dramatic way, not just Area C, and if it's not upgraded to something more than pal Palestinian uh, authority. And I've written about this. I will not repeat it in, for the Institute uh, in Foreign Affairs in 2010. The crucial moment for the PA could come once we reach the point of succession. There is no heir apparent in the PA. And Abbas, now 77, Moody, tending to sulk, uh, a leader who is easily offended, uh, keeps telling his entourage, the Central Committee of Fatah, etc., Executive Committee of the PLO, that he is thinking about retiring and resigning, that he misses his grandchildren, etc., etc., etc. Now, so far, he's staying in office, and he likes it. But people around him are beginning to take those hints that he's spreading much more seriously, and they leak it very quickly uh, to the press. I'll say something about theirs later, later. The next point is that we have municipal elections in the West Bank only on October 20th, and that should be uh, viewed to some extent as a, tri as a trial uh, to the uh, extent of success in the attempt uh, made by Abbas to resuscitate uh, Fatah after the sixth uh, uh, conference of Fatah, which convened in Bethlehem <laughs> in 2009. What we are seeing so far is that it, this is becoming, in some places, a test between different potential contenders to succession. And mainly, I would advise, watch Nablus, where Amin Makbul, Secretary of the uh, Revolutionary Council of uh, Fatah, uh, is running for mayor against uh, the veteran, uh, veteran uh, Fatah guy, Rasan Shaka, from a family that used to have the mayorship. Uh, and the battle there is going to tell us a lot about uh, succession. I would just say now that if Makbul wins, that would tell me that uh, a guy by the name of Mahmoud al Alul. I don't know how many of you know him, uh, may be a front runner in the uh, forthcoming battle for succession. Now, almost 20 years after Oslo, uh, we reached a point where Abbas himself, at one point, ordered his aides to review the possibilities uh, <coughs> of dismantling the PA. That's Abbas telling his people, where do we transfer, to whom do we transfer powers and responsibilities if we go for dismantlement of the PA? And he got a report that the best way to do it would be to go uh, to transfer most uh, uh, powers and respons responsibilities to the uh, local uh, municipalities. But that's just an illustration of the way he thinks, and I would like to quote to you from his latest uh, speech at the General Assembly, where because of Israel, of course, he said that the current situation is, uh, leading, uh, is leading to the weakening of the PA, undermining its ability to carry out its functions and implement its obligations, which threatens to subvert its very existence and threatens its collapse. Here you have Abbas on the podium of the UN admitting uh, that the trouble uh, is serious. Now, there are deliberations, no plan of action, and certainly no decision concerning the pos possible uh, dismantlement, unilateral dismantlement of the PA altogether. 
that is what I have always called collapsing into un the unwilling arms of Israel. Here are the keys. Uh, the most important deliberations, the deliberations were held in this Fatah Central Committee, Executive Committee of the PLO and other bodies, but the most important ones were the ones held in the Akalim, in the um, district councils uh, of the Fatah, where people were overwhelmingly in favor of dismantling uh, the PA. Who needs that? That was the tone in most uh, discussions. The argument being that the PA is playing the role of allowing Israel to have an occupation by proxy, that it allows Israel to have uh, an occupation, uh, to run an occupation in disguise, that the PA is becoming sort of a Palestinian style, style SLA, South Lebanese Army and the security zone uh, in the past. The main arguments in those debates against dismantling uh, the uh, PA uh, were coming from people who said that this would lead to the destruction of Fatah because they will lose the control of public sector and the patronage system which is asso associated uh, with it. The donors uh, uh, will stop uh, uh, pumping money into the territories and, and it is very important, there is no appetite that I can see in the West Bank for sliding into a third intifada. People pe perceive the second intifada, the 2000 intifada, as a major fiasco, as a major defeat, as something which gave them what is called here the wall, the fence. And there is no serious talk, apart from this allul that I already mentioned before, about the possibility of uh, uh, going to that. The next option is a more complex one. And the next option is retaining the PA, but delinking it, delinking it from the obligations and restrictions under Oslo. Abolishing Oslo unilaterally. This is supported by such illustrious uh, Palestinian politicians as Nabil Shaath, who is now the nominal boss of Fatah in the Gaza Strip, to the extent that Hamas allows them to operate. It's supported by our, our friend Yasser Abedrabbo, secretary of the PLO Executive uh, Committee. It's supported by Mahmoud El Alul, that I'm mentioning now for the third time for a good reason. And it's supported by other bodies, such as the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, etc. Et the idea is how to turn the PA from a product of a bilateral agreement with Israel into a vehicle of changing the ground rules. And it creates a multitude, a step like this, would create a multitude of opportunities for the PA unbound by Oslo to seek confrontations, not necessarily violent with Israel, over many issues. Activities in zones uh, B uh, and C, East Jerusalem, uh, economic arrangements, uh, whatever you want. Above all, it's supposed to grant the PA popular legitimacy. A de uh, PA. There are other ideas now in the air. In the, in the context of the withdrawal from the uh, two-state uh, concept. Sari Nuseiba, a respected uh, Palestinian uh, academic, is saying, let's think about a confederal system with Israel. And the PA should be the nucleus of the autonomous part of a future confederal state. So rather than taking, uh, stepping away from Oslo, he's saying, let's get closer uh, to Israel. Let's build another floor 
above Oslo, based on Oslo. He wrote about it. There are few people in the Palestinian intellectual elite who support the idea. It doesn't gain momentum amongst a uh, grassroots. Another idea which is being discussed now is the possibility of a confederal union between the PA in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip that is accepting the loss of the Gaza Strip to uh, Hamas and uh, in the absence of re reconciliation, which is doomed, buried. I'll come to that if, if I have the time. Uh, transforming, in, fa in fact, the PA into a regional authority, what they call the northern provinces of the future inshallah, a Palestinian state, and limited the PA's responsibilities to uh, the West Bank only. Please remember uh, Fayyad is saying, and there is no reason to doubt him, that he's spending 58% uh, of his budget on Gaza, mainly on pay, paying ex-government employees who don't go to the office anymore. This is where much of the donor's money uh, is going to. And what is very interesting is that we have more and more people, quietly, but more and more of them, talking about the possibility of relinking the West Bank to Jordan. Now, Ahmed Khaledi, that I've mentioned before, is leading this uh, trend. There are others uh, in the West Bank, especially those uh, families and clans who were traditionally close to the Hashemites in Nablus and uh, uh, Hebron who are echoing uh, it. The idea being let's strive, uh, and there are of course Jordanian politicians uh, who are uh, open to this uh, type of ideas. The idea being let's turn the West Bank and the PA uh, into the nucleus of a future extra, uh, another wilaya uh, province uh, of Jordan with some uh, special uh, arrangement. Needless to say, those people who are talking about relinking uh, the West Bank to Jordan are talking, are thinking in terms of Jordan being changed within the next two years or so. And I think that we are going to see turbulence in Jordan the test is not on yet, and probably the moment for a test in Jordan is the, mom is the morning after Assad. Uh, it's boiling, and there is nobody more aware than the Palestinians that Jordan is beginning uh, uh, to uh, boil. Now. The PA is uh, based on uh, the, Fa the Fatah. The Fatah is undergoing two important uh, uh, processes. One is the bureaucratization of Fatah. Fatah, as one of their leaders explained to me, lost its soul when, it's lo when it lost its guns. Fatah was about armed struggle. Abbas says no violence. Now it's the bureaucrats' party. So it's a, a movement with many, many thousands of members, but no grass, grassroots uh, uh, presence. And the second process that the Fatah has undergone, under, underwent, is the demilitarization of Fatah. The demilitarization of Fatah, which culminated in the dismantlement of the uh, uh, Al-Aqsa Martyrs uh, Brigade's uh, uh, organization through the David Citadel Agreement between Israel and the PA security and uh, uh, allowing the uh, people on the wanted list, the terrorists on the wanted list, to hand back their guns and through a phased out process get home. Um, this, of course, this armed wing of the Fatah was replaced by uh, the security agencies, what is sometimes called the Dayton Boys, and 
uh, which is run now by people who are Fatah, uh, but not involved in politics at this point. Their time, Majid Faraj, Nidal Abu Duhan, Hazem Atalla, their time will come when we get to the point of, of succession. They will have some say. It's very interesting, by the way, Hazem Atalla, the commander of the police in the West Bank, and police is important, more than in other countries which has army. Hazem Atalla is the son of one of the great foes and enemies of Yasser Arafat. Abu Zaim, one of the founding leaders of uh, Fatah. The very nomination of Hazem Atala to this job, being the son of Abu Zaim, was quite a statement uh, by Abbas. I want to finish just by a paragraph on uh, Gaza. In the elections, in the secret ballot now for Hamas leadership, Gaza has, uh, Hamas has made a decision. The decision is it's Gaza fortress. It's Citadel Gaza. Mr. Mashal, thank you for having these great ideas about reconciliation, about winning in the ballots in the West Bank in future elections. Thank you, Mr. Khaled Mashal. You were a great leader. You were a great leader. No more. And what we see is the, the uh, ascendance of the military wing, I call it a pasdaranization of Hamas. The military wing is, wing is taken over, won the elections together with Gaza. Hamas didn't get one vote, one member of the Shura Council, etc., uh, in Gaza. Uh, and uh, the uh, trend in Gaza now is towards creating a nucleus of, a rival nucleus of statehood uh, in Gaza. Now, whatever we think about Hamas, whatever people in Gaza think about Hamas, the performance of Hamas in governance is quite impressive. Just one illustration, their budget rose this year to close to uh, $800 million. Count 200 from Turkey, 200 from Qatar, you're beginning to have it. Uh, and they are drawing apart Gaza and the West Bank. It's different taxation, different regulations, different everything. It's becoming two countries, two separate uh, uh, countries. So, and against this, uh, uh, and Hamas, not to forget, Hamas is very active in the West Bank to undermine the PA. It's done, and this is interesting, through the new leader of Hamas West Bank, released in the Shalit deal, Sheikh uh, Saleh Aruri, who is residing where? In Turkey. And he's operating from Turkey with the full blessing of the Turkish government and the Turkish uh, uh, intelligence. One word about succession. All, almost half the members of the Fatah Central Committee see themselves or are, are viewed by others as uh, potential uh, 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 contenders. Dahlan, from his exile in UAE, he was sacked from the uh, Fatah, together with Muhammad Rashid, is running a campaign against uh, Abbas. And when Dahlan and Muhammad Rashid are talking about corruption, people are listening to them. They know something about it. <laughs> but Dahlan is already running. <coughs> He's already running. And the question is whether he will be able at one point to find allies who are still in the West Bank post uh, Abbas. Alul, as I said before, is running. He's a strong candidate. He's the ex-deputy chief of what was called the Western Sector, the terrorist arm of Arafat for 25 years. He was the deputy of Abu Firas Liftawi, for anybody who knows the names. Uh, Alul is coming from the hardcore terrorist uh, uh, apparatus of the uh, uh, of the Fatah, he has the credit, uh, and he's running all over the place. In the absence of a very good, impressive candidates, he may come. Marwan Barghouti in jail. Nobody views him as a as a serious uh, candidate, but because they cannot agree on somebody else, 
they may decide to, to make Marwan president, so they have some president in absentia. And some people uh, are talking uh, about that. And you have others, you have the old guard, Sultan Abu Einain, ex-commander of Fatah in Lebanon, Abu Mayer Abu Renein, uh, who just came in 09 from Tunis. Both of them op opposed Oslo from the beginning. Uh, they could be uh, uh, selected and others. But the question of who will finally emerge will decide, in my opinion, to a great degree, the question of whether the PA can at all survive that crisis. Thank you. Rob, you uh, promised uh, this audience sobriety. Um, and at 10 in the morning, I don't have any problem with that. Um, and realism, and we just got a large dose of it, um, of, a, of, a, of a fairly uh, dark realism. I'm not going to quarrel with uh, anything that we heard from Eud. I think that uh, uh, there will be some differences in nuance, um, uh, but essentially the, uh, the idea that what we're witnessing is a crisis for Palestinian structures of governance um, and we're at that we're at some sort of turning point, um, both uh, internally in terms of uh, Palestinian politics and internationally as well, is absolutely true. So I don't have any cheery news to uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, complement his or to to refute his 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 fairly uh, uh, dark views. Um, what I myself have to contribute, I mean, it is I'm. Uh, uh, an academic who tries to focus on sort of the nitty-gritty details of Palestinian politics. I say my specialty is, is, is Palestine made boring. Um, that is to say to actually sit down and take a look at the governing structures, the rules, the regulations, and so on, and try and figure out something about local politics from there, rather than starting from big picture. You talked about, you know, 40,000, uh, a view from 40,000 feet versus a, a sort of ground level approach, so I try to take a ground level approach, not start from my own policy uh, preferences or prescriptions and work backwards from there uh, to map reality, but to go the other way around, to start with uh, a, a existing realities. And to do so in a sense in a time-lapse manner. I've been following Palestinian politics since the late 1990s, making periodic trips and just trying to figure out what has happened uh, in the meantime. And my basic answer then to the question, I think, is, is fairly similar uh, to it was a bit in one way kind of perhaps uh, in, in, in most of what I will have to say will be similar but less dramatic, but in one way more dramatic. Is the, uh, uh, is the PA about to collapse? And my answer would be, well, no, it did about 10, 15 years ago. Um, we just haven't noticed yet. And I mean that not necessarily in the sense of as an administrative structure. Actually, I think that kind of collapse is unlikely. It's not impossible, but unlikely. But in terms of its raison d'etre, it basically lost its hold on the Palestinian uh, uh, political imagination and its legitimacy quite some time ago. Um, and, and outsiders were just very slow to realize what was going on. Um, let me tr tr begin, therefore, by tr uh, sort of looking backwards and then and then uh, uh, looking forwards a little bit. I mean, what is a Palestinian authority? And, and what I'm going to focus on here are Palestinian views of what the Palestinian authority was, not what it is in the Oslo process, where you read incredible amounts of, 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 of painful detail about what it can do and what it can't do, uh, but very little about what, it, uh, what it's about. And in fact, any time that, if you look in the Oslo courts, they get close to doing things like describing it as a kernel of a Palestinian state, they draw back when it comes to postage stamps, when it comes to passports and so forth. So even the title of the Palestinian Authority itself is, is a way of trying to defer all the questions of what its purpose was. From a Palestinian perspective, however, there was always a clear purpose. This was going to be the kernel of a Palestinian state. And the critique of the Palestinian Authority from the beginning um, came from two camps. One that said, this is part of a two-state solution which we don't buy. Um, that was essence from, from Hamas, but there was an, a, a trenchant a Palestinian critique that didn't reject the two-state solution in principle, but just said, this is not going to lead there. This construction of Palestinian authority is going to lead to, essentially, um, you know, Camp David minus, as some sort of internal autonomy plan where we're governing our own cities. What happened was after the Palestinian Authority was set up in, in, the, in the mid to late 1990s, that critique began to gain ground, that critique that said this is not leading to a Palestinian state. Whatever was happening at the international level didn't have an awful lot of resonance or credibility within Palestinian society. So people basically began to sort of disengage from the, what, from, 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 from the Palestinian Authority, seeing it as a kernel of, of, of statehood, and a second 
very trenchant critique. Domestic critique was added to that as well. Um, some state. Um, this is essentially what you're doing is you're giving us all the uh, attributes of Arab authoritarianism and, uh, and, and corruption with none of the benefits of statehood. And that critique, I would say, was fairly powerful by the time of the, first, of the Second Intifada and actually contributed greatly to the, the Second Intifada. What happened during the Second Intifada was essentially, I think, Palestinians began to draw back after some time from the implications of that. And that basically began about 2002 or so, when the po prospect of the collapse of the Palestinian Authority, in, in a literal sense, that administrative entity, looked quite real. I mean, the president was being besieged, um, uh, they, 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 they had no money, no freedom of movement, and so forth and so on. And Palestinian leadership at that point drew back. I mean, you, you heard the same kind of ideas. Why not just declare the Palestinian authority over, hand over the keys and give it back? And they drew back from that. And instead what happened was an effort essentially to um, reform the Palestinian authority that had some international support for all different kinds of reasons. That project, I think, in essence, was what was going on in domestic Palestinian politics between about 2002 and 2006, and culminated in the 2006 parliamentary elections. This was supposed to be the, the Palestinian Authority reviving itself, renewing its, its popular and democratic credentials, um, and so on. And of course, the result, instead of a renewal of the Palestinian Authority, was um, um, a the, uh, a Palestinian civil war and the split of the Palestinian Authority into two halves uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, the, um, I'll, I'll mention Gaza a little bit later on, but in the West Bank, what this led to is sort of a real, um, um, a, a real crisis. The Fayyad government was an attempt to respond to that crisis. Um, and um, uh, here I will sort of paint with very broad strokes. I've sort of written about this elsewhere. When outsiders tended to look to Fayyad, they tended to look to him as doing two things. Number one, he was, he was uh, an emblem of Palestinian self-reliance. And number two, he was engaged in a process of institution building that would lead to a state. I don't think any of those, either of those were persuasive to very many people inside, right? Self-reliance, no. He's completely fiscally dependent, and institution building, the institution he's building in a, is in a sense Fayyad. When Western governments come and say over and over, we need an institution building project and only Fayyad can lead, lead it, it's a very strange view of institutions if it only has one proper name attached to it. Um, and that's what was going on. So, so what happened instead, from, I think in, ter in domestic terms, was that you had a program of improved public administration, improved uh, 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 fiscal procedure, one that was solidly backed by the international community, and suddenly salaries were paid on time. And that meant something. And suddenly traffic lights were restored and they worked. And that did mean something. But this was not about building a Palestinian state anymore. This was about recovering from the uh, catastrophe of, of the uh, Second Intifada. And it, the other thing that it meant was an end to any sort of popular legitimacy or democratic procedures and so on. This was a, this was a strategy that was built that could only survive so long as there were not Palestinian elections. Um, and, 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 and that's what it meant. It was a way of coping while something better came along. Um, that seems now to be running its course. Money is beginning to run out. I mean, it would, uh, talk, uh, 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 talked about this. The, uh, the, uh, the amount of kind of institution building you can do is simply based on improved public administration, I think, has sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of come, come to an end. And the question is, is uh, what now? Um, it, my, my own sense is that the Palestinian Authority, if it ends an administrative entity, will not end with a gigantic bang but with a bunch of whimpering. And that's essentially what we're seeing right now. The, uh, the uh, Palestinian Authority has, in a sense, lo lo it's lost its legitimacy a long time ago, but it hasn't lost its payroll. It hasn't lost its, uh, its uh, 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 um, uh, ability to, to uh, oh, it's, 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 it's ability to, to, to uh, pay salaries has decayed a little bit, or, or actually it's quite, quite seriously, but there's still an awful lot of ways in which a lot of Palestinian households in the West Bank are dependent on this structure. And the fact is that when you go 
for instance, to a Palestinian court or to a Palestinian school or to all kinds of Palestinian institutions, you're still dealing with structures that have some kind of Palestinian oversight and some kind of Palestinian participation. Um, and, and that still, I think, means something to people. So the debate that you were talking about when you were talking about how it is that Fatah is debating in the, in the, in the, uh, 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 the provincial branches what to do, I think that captures the debate very, very well. Do we fold it up? Do we hand it over? Do we de de disentangle it from Oslo? But in a sense, it's a debate that's divorced a little bit from reality. None of these options really lead anywhere. Um, and people know that. People outside of the leadership knows knows that, and that's where we get, in a sense, to the to to, to the um, um, uh, a current internal Palestinian debate. To me, the most striking aspect of the current Palestinian political debate is not the. Uh, rejection of the two-state solution. And here's where I will disagree, but only on nuance. Um, there is that kind of debate. Do we want two-state? Do we want one-state? Do we want confederation? So forth and so forth. That debate is actually taking place. But to me, the really critical element of the pal internal Palestinian debate is, I would say, grammatical in nature. It's a switch from the active to the passive voice. Not what are we going to do, but what's going to happen to us. And the, uh, there are, of course, Palestinian leaders and Palestinian political movements who claim to offer an alternative. To me, it is absolutely striking how their alternatives seem to spark no resonance in Palestinian society. Let me um, talk about the uh, West Bank here first. The, the Palestinian Authority Project is not leading to statehood. It's just not. You do have a few voices, and Alul is among them, who's basically saying, let's go back to our roots in... in, 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 in uh, in Fatah, I interviewed a little about a year ago, and I asked him, do you expect a new intifada? And he says, are, are you planning for this? He says, these aren't things you plan for. These are things that are thrust upon you, um, which I took to mean yes. Um, there are some people like this. Um, but again, with the Palestinian authority that so many people are dependent upon, and the memories of the Second Intifada so present in people's minds, I'm not sure that, I mean, you, you will have some followers for this, but essentially, I think the, the ideas don't have a tremendous degree of popular resonance. In a sense, the p current Palestinian leadership on the West Bank has no viable uh, strategy. And this is where I would actually disagree with Haywood the strongest. He used a phrase at one point, Palestinian strategy. I think there is none. That phrase makes no sense, certainly not on the West Bank. Um, so, so they're talking about these, these the, 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 they're, they're arguing endlessly about these options in, 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 in sort of small discussions, but, but they're not, they're not uh, uh, married to any kind of viable course of action. In terms of Ham Hamas, yes, I think exactly what uh, is going on uh, is, 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 is uh, uh, what, what you say. Hamas, in this sense, I like to put it, is they have become the movement that their founders warned them against. They have become so married to the fact that they have their own little Palestinian authority in Gaza, and they're hunkering down and thinking essentially, um, um, we can govern Gaza. My evaluation of, of, Gaza, of Hamas governance in Gaza would probably not be quite as favorable as yours, but, but they are effectively governing the place. They are deeply entrenched in Gaza. And the future will bring something better. There's no, we're not in any particular hurry. International trends are moving in our direction. We can sit and wait till something better comes along. Um, and something better will uh, uh, come along. For Palestinians outside of Hamas, what that means is that Hamas has basically become kind of the, par the party of power in Gaza, wedded to political power in a way that they said they never would be. Um, and again, offering nothing other than let's wait for others. So you have these two Palestinian national movements, Fatah and Hamas, both of which were founded explicitly to say Palestinians need their own options. Fatah basically to say we can't rely on the Arab world, Palestinians have to act for themselves within an Arab, Arab nationalist context, yes, but we need our own political movements, and it now basically offers nothing but um, continued uh, um, uh, shaking the cup internationally. And Hamas, essentially the same sort of thing. Um, and we're just going to wait for our big brothers in Egypt to finally realize um, um, 
Um, we don't seem to be high on their priority list right now, and that's causing real uh, frustration in, in, in Hamas. But sooner or later, this situation will, will break to our advantage. So what the leadership has to offer is waiting for other people, waiting for external actors. So the tone of Palestinian political debate that, that, that I pick up, and, and again, this is kind of, you know, sort of, sort of time lapse, um, outside of the leaderships of those two movements, is that, um, A, I think you're absolutely right, the, the idea of a Palestinian state the idea that we will have an entity called Palestine and it will have postage stamps and passports and, and, and this sort of thing. We've seen something like that and it's not so great after all. So, so, so that doesn't excite people anymore. Um, the question of kind of what we do, well, there are a few people who are trying to think in active terms, but to me, they're, they're very small in number and they don't really have any viable alternatives uh, to offer, even those people outside of Hamas and Fatah. So the debate instead is a little bit about what is going to happen. When will some kind of upsurge of popular mobilization begin? Um, when will, I mean, there's, there's actually, a str I think, a strong consensus, in, in, at least in West Bank society, that, yes, the second intifada was a disaster, but some kind of upsurge of popular mobilization will occur at some point at some time, and you have a lot of talk it's beginning to resettle, but it's still there, about popular resistance, whatever that means. And the question that people ask themselves, I think, is not how do we plan for this? What, does, what, shape, uh, what shape do we want this to take? Who's going to organize it? Who's going to lead it? But kind of when is it going to start happening? Um, because sooner or later, you know, the, we, I, I, I'm, again, I'm talking in terms of the, the debate among Palestinians, our, our national identity is still strong and it will express itself in some ways. The current situation is, um, is um, unsustainable and sooner or later it will, it will break down. Um, and Palestinians will return to, the, um, uh, uh, to activity in some way, shape or form. Do I think that that's actually going to happen? Yes, ultimately I think it will. But I, uh, I, I frequently like to quote, I don't remember when it was, I think it was about 2009 or so, a, you know, quartet statements that come out periodically warning that the situation is unsustainable. In about 2009, you actually had a quartet statement that said, began, the situation continues to be unsustainable. <laughs> And that's where I think Palestinian politics will be for the next few years. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, um, Ehud and Nathan, two complimentary uh, presentations. Um, uh, let me ask uh, both of you about an actor who um, didn't really come up much in either of your presentations, um, but not a disinterested nor a distant actor, and that's the State of Israel. And, uh, and what you might think would be is Israel's approach to the situation you've just described. Uh, where do Israel's interests lie and what actions do you think Israel will take under this government or really any conceivable near-term future government to, uh, to shape the environment that both of you described? And then I'll open the floor to your, uh, to your questions and, uh, and comments. If you could, um, if you could uh, speak from the podium for your responses, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um. I, I said uh, in one uh, brief sentence that I think that the uh, survival uh, of the PA requires extending its jurisdiction, this, the territorial scope where it can operate into areas B and C, and an upgrading in its status. Um, I think with the following the next Israeli elections, we may, if my hunch, it's no more than hunch, is correct, we may have a different composition of the Israeli uh, government, which will be more centrist. That is, if I have to place a bet today, I know I don't have to do that, but I will uh, place a bet. I would place a bet on a, 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 a liquid labor coalition, a coalition which is different than the present coalition. That type of coalition may open the way for some uh, 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 moves on the Palestinian scene. scene. What I would uh, envisage as the necessary uh, move is, and. Uh, 
I'll say it in two sentences, is we need to go to a very generous interim with the Palestinians, simply because the final status deal proves elusive. I'm talking about a deal which encompasses more than 90% of the West Bank territory, which will require removal of 40 or 50,000 of the settlers, short of a peace treaty between Israel and Palestinians, short of end of conflict, end of claims, short of Palestinian recognition in Israel as a Jewish state, something which I propose to call armistice. It's different from merely a ceasefire. I think this is, this is the way to go. Now, this approach was publicly adopted finally by Defense Minister Barak. But he's not going to be a player in the next government. Uh, this approach would suit uh, uh, Mr. Olmert, who I heard this morning is contemplating whether he can run while he's still, he's still on trial for some uh, corruption and some corruption charges. Um, personally, privately, Mr. Netanyahu was always interested in, in these options. He never took action. But he was uh, interested. But this is what I think should be done. Because the preservation of the PA uh, is indispensable in order to maintain, maintain the two-state uh, 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 prospect. Uh, if the PA is allowed to disintegrate, to di dismantle itself, to just fall into decay, that means the two-state solution would no, would, would no longer be there. And the time to act is, is now. I thought the time to act was two years ago. But we didn't have the right relationship between the US president and the Israeli prime minister for that. But after the next elections, let's say by February, and that's probably before you have to think again about Iran, that's about the time. Nathan? Thanks. Um, if you ask me what Israel is going to do, you're probably better off asking an Israeli than, 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 than me. I would, uh, um, I would still probably amplify Ud's uh, comments, but also give a m more pessimistic spin on them. You said you suggested this kind of ideas two years ago. Um, I, uh, in one of my few forays into policy recommendation, I suggested something like this actually five years ago. Um, and some of the strongest pushback I got it was actually from Palestinians. And what did this look like to them? This looked like essentially imposition of a sort of a unilateral imposition of a final settlement. Um, and and they weren't they weren't interested in it. Now, do I think that this kind of solution could work? I actually think it would. It would probably resuscitate the PA. Uh, but, but I actually think that, again, because the current situation, for all its problems, is one which is fundamentally viable for Israel, I don't expect bold moves. I just don't. I mean, you, you know, you're talking to the players involved, and you, you, you talk about people who are actually sort of entertaining these kinds of, of, of uh, dramatic ideas. Uh, perhaps it will happen, but I just kind of remain skeptical that 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 uh, uh, political leaders in a coalition government will be able to coalesce around something that no previous Israeli government has been able to do. If they were to do it, I think it might uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it might possibly resuscitate the PA in kind of the short to medium term. But there wouldn't be any Palestinian embrace of this. You wouldn't you wouldn't have any thank yous for having done this. Instead, what you would say you would have Palestinians publicly reacting as this is a trap, and for that reason, I would expect kind of in the in the in the medium term the situation to sour again um, uh, uh, fairly. Uh, quickly. So if you're looking for dramatic action from the Israeli government, that's probably about the most hopeful idea that I can think of. But I'm not sure that they're capable of doing it, and I'm not sure in the long run it would pay off. It's as good an idea as any other. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's open to the floor to your questions. Uh, Howard, and then we'll move over here. You can, there's a mic right behind you. Well, thank you. Thank you to you both. I, I, this was really um, quite, quite useful. I'm glad you asked the question, Rob, about what about Israel, because I was thinking uh, toward the end, um, 
that if I had just come down from Mars, I think we were talking about a Palestinian state on some isolated island in the South Pacific that's having trouble governing itself. Um, I appreciated what you said, Ahud, about uh, um, Israel taking some actions to give access to Area C and to upgrade the status of, um, of the Palestinian Authority. So I, I wonder if you, when you reflect back on what I have often thought of as five or six years of wasted opportunities, that is to say the period in which Fayyad was doing his administrative uh, or, or uh, what's the term you use, Nathan? Uh, administrative reform kind of thing. During that period when, when Dayton was training security forces, it's, it seemed to many of us that Israel wasn't taking constructive, compensatory, or encouraging steps to give access to Area C, to relax adequately the movement constraints within the West Bank, to, to improve access from the West Bank into Israel for economic uh, trade, for export, and so on. Um, and uh, not living up to agreements that apparently were there to avoid incursions and particularly nighttime incursions in the areas where, 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 where Dayton's forces, like Janine, were, were trained and in place. If, if Israel was unable to do that from, say, 2007 until, until now, under both Olmert's government and Netanyahu's government, what was the reason for that? And why do you think there's a chance something could change after the next election? Thank you. First, uh, let me give you a quote, which I don't think is uh, very often uh, uh, used in the, at least uh, in U.S. discourse about the, the issue, which is um, Olmert, who was the prime minister at the time, made the, uh, the offer he made to uh, Abbas following 35, 36 meetings long meetings. Uh, I'll, I'll just make a quote. After he made the, uh, the, the offer and presented the map, etc., 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 what was uh, Abbas's uh, response? Abbas's response, quote, unquote. Uh, quote, unquote, was, I didn't come here, Mr. Prime Minister, to get a lesson in arithmetic, unquote. So, well, the Israelis at that time trying to do something very serious, an offer which you can read what uh, Condoleezza Rice had to say, how stunned she was with the offer that Olmert made, that was a major effort to go for the end game. Number two, it took time before the Dayton boys, the seven battalions, were ready. It took time, and it took time to Fayyad amongst other things, having to fight Fatah all the time, having to fight Fatah all the time, having to fight Abbas all the time. There is no lost love between these two. No lost love, believe me. Uh, it took time to Fayyad to get to a point where he streamlined, streamlined, uh, streamlined to a great degree the performance of the uh, Palestinian civil uh, public sector uh, etc., uh, etc. Et in terms of uh, 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 roadblocks, access and movement, there was a huge change in the territories. Hebron is again, I call uh, Hebron uh, Genua or Venice of the West Bank. It doesn't have fleets of, uh, sheep, of ships. It has fleets of trucks all over and colonies all over, including across uh, the border. Uh, 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 commerce in a city like Hebron, is flourishing because so many roadblocks were uh, uh, removed. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu, when he came to power, uh, which is almost four years ago, Mr. Netanyahu had the kind of coalition which did not allow him to move a lot. So he did little things. And I'm not defending that record because I think more should have, should have been done and in the framework of this institute, I was writing about it. Uh, and there are other 
proposals uh, 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 out there. Uh, he uh, uh, did not feel that he was comfortable or capable politically uh, to uh, uh, mount uh, an initiative. First, we had the freeze of settlements, then the refusal of uh, Abbas to uh, resume uh, negotiations until this uh, moment. Uh, th there wasn't man much to do, because I think what, what, what it takes is, uh, it takes the Prime Minister of Israel, whoever he's going to be, to say to the donor states, but first of all to the, United, to the President of the US, I am ready to go this far. I understand that we cannot get the final deal now, but we don't want the status quo. And I want to upgrade the PA into Palestinian statehood short of recognition of Israel. We can do that. Uh, what you need, Nathan said correctly, the Palestinians are not uh, for it. But I allow myself to quote uh, Abu Mazen in a conversation, which was not off the record. Abu Mazen says, give me, uh, for a great interim, give me, give me uh, uh, endorsement of the Security Council. The US can do that. And if the donor states and the, uh, 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 led by the US are going to say to whoever is going to succeed Abbas or to Abbas, this is where we can go. You're not called upon to make the ultimate concessions on refugees, on Jerusalem, on anything. It's just an interim agreement, internationally endorsed, backed by the Security Council. What choice do the Palestinians have but to accept? Grudgingly? Maybe. My impression from talking to many Palestinians about this over the past four or five years, they have no choice. If they want the money to flow, they have no choice. And this is the only way, I'm speaking very bluntly about this, that Israel can compel the Palestinians to go for statehood. Because otherwise, they are not going there. Thank you. Yes, side. It's a, it, I thought it was on. Yeah. Uh, my name is Saeed Erika from Al Quds Daily Newspaper. Uh, it seems that the Palestinian strategy, Nathan, could be summed up in waiting for Godot. You know, that that seems to be their strategy. My question to Ehud uh, Yairi is that, on the one hand, you say that the authority, the Palestinian authority, is indispensable. But everything that you actually talked about, it shows why it really it serves no purpose. It serves no purpose in terms of. Uh, the foundation from which it emerged back uh, in 1993 to, to, to take the Palestinian into a Palestinian statehood. So explain to me what shred of evidence that you have that remains for the viability of a two-state solution. And Rob, I wish someone from the Palestinian Authority was also invited to participate in this session. Thank you. Do you either gentleman, you want to come back? Nathan? Nathan? I repeat what I said. I think the uh, PA is indispensable uh, in order to uh, 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 keep going towards a two-state solution, which I think is the preferred uh, option. If you don't have a Palestinian PNA, Palestinian National Administration, in place as a nucleus of a future state, it's going to be uh, very complicated. The fact that so far, it's not fu functioning uh, as best as it should, uh, which had little, by the way, to do with uh, Israel. Um, World Bank report is, is very good on this. Why is there no money coming to the West Bank? Private. Why there are no investments? How come other countries are investing in all sorts of projects and then they are standing waiting for Palestinian uh, businessmen to come and invest, and nobody is willing. And they are doing a lot of investments. Everybody is investing in a second house in Amman, in Qatar, etc. 
It's not that Palestinians are not shrewd uh, businessmen. But nobody wants to, to invest in the, in the West Bank. Anyway, it's the indispensable to maintain uh, the cause in order, and it should be helped to stay in power in the territories. How? By expanding its, its, uh, the, the scope of its activities and by upgrading its status. This is all that I'm saying. What's a, a question? Now, now I, I, I don't know. Creeping settlements. Where do you have new settlements? I don't know. I go a lot in the West Bank. I see the settlements. I said to you that I think even in interim we need to take out 50,000, which is a big feat for any Israeli prime minister. But I don't see a settlement movement now. They are building in the settlement blocks mainly. And yes, there will be a, a, a big struggle with right-wing settlers who want to settle where they shouldn't be. But uh, it was done in Gaza, and, in, and you have a strong Israeli consensus of 70-80% of people who are saying to you const const constantly that they prefer the two-state solution and are willing to, make, to, to, to pay for it. Nathan, you want to add? Uh, no. yeah, uh, Esther? Thanks, both of you. Uh, yeah. Um, I was want to follow up on Nathan Brown's last point about Palestinian leaders waiting for some expression of Palestinian nationalism to emerge. And I'm, I'm wondering from both of you, why is it that at a time when the Arab world is exploding and there isn't a country in the region just about where you haven't seen that kind of uh, expression of, of nationalism or of, 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 of popular uprising, the West Bank has been quiet. And, you know, if, if, if in fact there's so much unhappiness with, with the PA and the delegitimization of the PA, why haven't, you know, we seen more of that on the ground in the West Bank? And it wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, there have been several moments when Palestinian leaders have tried to engender it and gotten no response. One last question, Fayyad, you mentioned him briefly. Is there any role for him at all in any kind of future uh, Palestinian political situation? Or is he so tainted by this enterprise that he's going to be gone soon. So why no Arab Spring in Palestine? Nathan? Um, um, two reasons. Number one, what Ehud was talking about, the exhaustion from the Second Intifada, right? So, so whatever kind of Arab Spring has to happen um, would be one that, in order to get much Palestinian support, would have to look like uh, something different. Um, and that is in a, f and, and that brings me to my second reason, there was an attempt and it fizzled. Um, I'm not sure that it won't return at some point, but, but here's my interpretation of what happened last year. I was in the West Bank a couple times last year and talking to people who were actually trying to spark this kind of movement. I discovered something actually very interesting when talking to Palestinians about what they saw in Tunis and Cairo and other places. And the reaction, if a, almost universal from Palestinians who were like over 35 was, hey, we used to do that. They learned those techniques from us. And anybody under 35 was, we can do that here. Those people actually tried. There were two problems that they had. Number one, what is the target, right? I mean, it, it, they, there is no Ben Ali. There's no Mubarak. It, what are they targeting? Are they targeting the division? Are they targeting the occupation? So they had a lot of big debates about what it was that they were targeting. Um, there's a problem, how do they do it? There's no, you know, they can easily take over Menara Square and Ramallah, and they did. And what does that get them? It doesn't get them what taking over Tahrir Square does. So there were questions of sort of tactics and, 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 and targets and so on. And then the big problem was when they finally did begin to galvanize some people, which they did um, uh, not in, in the spring of, of 2011, the situation in other Arab countries was different because, in a sense, in a lot of these places, organized politics had died there were no viable opposition political parties in these places. Political space was empty. Not completely empty, but largely empty in places like Tunisia and Egypt. So that a new kind of non-ideological movement could easily arise and excite people. Palestinian political space is occupied by Hamas and Fatah. And that meant as soon as some young person starts raising a sign saying, let's match in Square, everybody's saying, okay, who put them up to it? Was it are they Fatah or are they Hamas? 
or the, who, if they're with Fatah, which faction in Fatah, and so on. And when they would say, no, we're just for you know, all Palestinian nationalism, yeah, but who are you really for? And the movements themselves actually got out in front of either trying to suppress them, steer them, take them over, and this sort of thing. And you basically saw it fizzle as a result of those kind of tactical questions and, and essentially the, 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 what, what they did manage to achieve a year ago last spring was Hamas and Fatah in a moment of panic sitting down and agreeing to start reconciliation talks. Okay? And as soon as they did that, Hamas and Fatah basically said, okay, children, you've made your point, now the adults are going to take over and set up you know, 50 different committees who are going to carefully negotiate Palestinian reconciliation. And that's where it ended. And Ehud, you want to close by telling us whether uh, uh, Salam Fayyad has a political future? Uh, Esther, but, but the, f the first thing, why no Arab Spring? Everybody in the West Bank is watching Jordan. They are watching Jordan in the same way that Jordan is watching Syria. There is a sequence here. And they are watching Jordan because they are linked to Jordan, they are connected to Jordan. Many of them are Jordanian citizenship, carrying Jordanian passport etc., etc., they want to see what happens in Amman. I know, I suspect, that you are not watching soccer games. But had you watched the soccer game, the last one, between the Palestinian team, Wahdat, of the refugee camp Wahdat, and Faisali, the ultimate East Jordanian team, and the screams and the shouts and the slogans between each other, you would understand that it's getting close. Because it's always hot, hot, when uh, Faisali plays Wahdat, but not uh, so politicized. So the West Bank is waiting for, for Jordan, is watching Jordan. Uh, and Fayyad. I think Fayyad's, Fayyad's handicap is that he was never a Fatah member. And Fatah is fighting him and is trying to get rid of him. I can tell you, and Nathan referred to the demonstrations that we saw recently in Manara Square, etc., against the uh, uh, price, uh, uh, rising prices and the VAT, uh, etc. Initially, it was sanctioned by Abbas against uh, Fayyad. By afternoon, when he turned and the slogan started to be directed against Abbas and the uh, PA, then uh, there were certain measures taken, it was uh, over. But they didn't mind at all having a good uh, uh, a few hours of, demonstra of people demonstrating uh, against Fayyad. I think Fayyad has the ambition. He certainly has the capability. He doesn't have the constituency. So unless he is capable at one point of allying himself with one of the rival factions within Fatah, I'm afraid he, he is not going to, to uh, have a chance. Uh, I would say that there are several uh, people that I see with, with, with important constituencies within Fatah who would probably uh, be willing to uh, cooperate uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with Fayyad. But I don't see it happening yet. What you see now is people positioning themselves some people already campaigning a little, carefully, not to annoy Abbas, like Shtaye, Alul, people like this. Uh, but people are afraid to start the real succession game. And Fayyad, I'm sure, although I don't know the details, I'm sure he's trying to find out who his potential allies uh, uh, are.